wonder where the aileron came from? How about seaplanes and flying boats? Hi everybody, I'm Tim Cole for avweb.com and we're traveling this week to Hammondsport, New York in the Finger Lakes district of western New York State. The so-called skunk works of aeronautical experimentation in the early years of the last century. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, came to Hammondsport in pursuit of man's dream to fly. So did industrialist Henry Ford. They came to confer with Glenn Hammond Curtis, aviation pioneer and inventor extraordinaire, who developed the OX series of aviation engines, the Jenny, the mighty seaplane America, and the Navy's NC-4, first plane to cross the Atlantic. Here's Trafford Doherty, executive director of the Curtis Museum, and Art Wilder, chief of the museum restoration shop, to tell us more. Later, we'll visit the Curtis Museum's annual seaplane fly-in on nearby Cuca Lake, where Curtis's early work took place. I'm the director of the Glen H. Curtis Museum, in which you're standing, and I've been here for 10 years now. We're located in Hammondsport, New York. We are a museum of local history, and we focus, obviously, on the accomplishments of Glen Hammond Curtis. But in addition to that, you'll see cars and boats and motorcycles and bicycles, so we're really kind of a general history museum with an aviation focus. On June 28, 1907, Curtis made his first flight ever piloting a Baldwin dirigible powered by one of his engines about a mile that way from here. And that's how he got into aviation, through his engine expertise. Into the winter of 1908, they were experimenting with gliders up on the hill above the museum right behind me. And then in March of 1908, they built their first heavier-than-air flying machine, the Red Wing, operating it off the ice on the lake, had two little skids on it. They, made, they managed to fly it of about 100 yards, a little over 300 feet, before it heeled over and crashed. It had no form of lateral control, no ailerons. At that point, they decided they needed some way of controlling the aircraft laterally, so they developed what they call the horizontal rudder. The aileron term is actually French, and it was a while before Curtis and his associates started using it. White Wing, the next of the series after the Red Wing, was more successful because it had these their wingtip ailerons. That was followed by the June Bug. Now we have a reproduction here of the June bug. On July 4th, 1908, Curtis made a flight of almost a mile, it was 5,080 feet here. And it was in front of a crowd of over 1,000 people. There was newsreel photography and newspaper uh, reporters. On that day, two very important things happened. Curtis became a household word as a pioneer aviator. And aviation itself actually stepped into the public eye in this country. But moving on, Curtis is considered the father of U.S. naval aviation. In 1911, Curtis actually located out in San Diego, set up shop out there at North Island, and taught the Navy's first pilot how to fly, Lieutenant El Theodore Ellison. But go, actually go back a year, his development of the flying boat, the Model E. Behind me, a ways back, is a green-hulled silver wing flying boat. It's, it's a reproduction built here by our guys of the first flying boat, the Model E. It actually designed 1912, and this particular model was flown in 1913. Curtis invented the flying boat. In our restoration shop, which we, we refer to as our playpen, really, uh, we have uh, all kinds of wood and metalworking tools. We've got uh, pretty much a complete machine shop made out of uh, uh, which is old, old machinery. None of us are digitally controlled, and none of the machines are either. And we have real good woodworking equipment. Uh, we have a welding capability. We, uh, we rely on Mercury Aircraft, our, our, our biggest corporate sponsor here in town, to, to help us out on things when we can't do it. And uh, we, we really got a, got a talented group of people. We'd like to have more of them, but uh, that, that can just about do almost anything we need. You, gotta, you can't go to the airplane store and buy parts for something that's back in the, in the early teens or, or 20s even. So you, you're, you fabricate, you do it. We arrived in Hammond Sports Depot Park for the Curtis Museum's annual seaplane homecoming. Here's a quick look at the sights and sounds. Thanks go out to local Cameron Dunlap, who took AvWeb on an aerial tour of Cuca Lake aboard his beautifully refurbished 1958 Cessna 182 STC to accept straight Edo floats. Cameron showed us what the lake must have looked like to Curtis and other aviation pioneers. Thanks also go out to Steve Kent, regional sales director of Cessna Aircraft Company, who brought a stunning brand new float equipped stationaire. And lose the air conditioner.
it'll be fun. If you'd like to learn more about Glenn Curtis and America's early days of aviation, visit www.glennhcurtismuseum.org. For avweb.com, reporting from Hammondsport, New York, I'm Tim Cole. Thanks for watching.